This is Dr. Dave Barnhart with Behavioral Sciences of Alabama. In addition to our usual clinical work with people of all ages, we provide outpatient and intensive outpatient treatment for obsessive compulsive and related disorders. We are an institutional affiliate of the International OCD Foundation. Exposure and Response Prevention, ERP, is a type of cognitive behavioral therapy used for treating obsessive compulsive disorder. The E in ERP stands for exposure and it refers to confronting the thoughts, images, objects, and situations that make a person with OCD anxious or uncomfortable. The RP stands for response prevention and refers to making a choice not to do a compulsive behavior or ritual after coming into contact with the things that make a person with OCD anxious or uncomfortable. This strategy of confronting or directly facing fears may not sound right to most people. We tend to avoid the things that we fear. Those with OCD have probably confronted their obsessions many times and tried to stop themselves from doing their compulsive behavior only to see their anxiety or discomfort skyrocket. With ERP, a person with the help of an experienced therapist makes the commitment to not give in and do the compulsive behavior until they notice a drop in their anxiety. In fact, it is best if the person stays committed to not doing the compulsive behavior at all. The natural drop in anxiety that eventually happens when sufferers stay exposed and prevent the response is called habituation. In the treatment of OCD, we collect a list of situations and intrusive thoughts that trigger discomfort. These are arranged into an exposure hierarchy. An exposure hierarchy is a list of the main things that lead to anxiety or discomfort and are arranged by severity of the discomfort. These triggers are rated using the subjective units of discomfort scale, SUDS, a scale ranging from 1, meaning almost no discomfort, to 10, the worst anxiety or discomfort possible. You can see where this individual rated the triggers on this social anxiety list. We usually begin doing exposure treatment starting with items within the moderate range of 4 to 6. Patients help in selecting where to start exposure. The list in this slide deals with triggers that relate to social anxiety which often accompany OCD. Exposure therapy has a broad application and is effective in treating most anxiety disorders including social, health, separation anxiety, and specific phobias. Bear in mind that our patients collaborate in deciding where to start and are not forced to confront something they are not prepared for and have not agreed to try. Adults are usually highly motivated to work on difficult issues and we assist youth and children by setting goals so they can earn rewards which helps with their motivation. Here we see an example of a contamination hierarchy without SUD or subjective units of discomfort ratings. This list includes touching the bottom of a shoe and the top of a shoe. You might think of how you would rate these items. Even people without contamination OCD will have some concern about some of the listed items such as touching fixtures in a public restroom. But people without OCD could face these without any lasting discomfort and without much intensity even though they may be reluctant. Think about touching a toilet seat in a public restroom and how uncomfortable you would feel on a scale of 1 to 10. Would your concern keep you from using a bathroom if the urge was very strong? If so, you may have some empathy with people suffering from OCD because their discomfort may impair them even in a well-kept public restroom. Imagining the confrontation of a feared stimulus will often evoke feelings of anxiety. 
We actually use imagined stimuli in many situations in order to evoke feelings of anxiety, which leads to habituation. We call this imaginal exposure, and we call direct confrontation of the feared stimulus in vivo exposure. In facing contamination, a person could imagine touching and becoming contaminated with a feared substance. They may watch videos of people dealing with contaminants, having medical procedures, and many other indirect methods that may aid their imagination. What follows are examples of possible exposure strategies in a fear of becoming contaminated from touching a shoe. If you remember, we had touching the bottom and top of a shoe as part of a list on our example of a hierarchy for contamination exposure. To successfully carry out these exposures, it may be necessary to start with very small steps and break the hierarchy into components. We'll show you a breakdown of touching shoes within its own hierarchy. Recognize here that we are showing you very clean shoes being touched by really clean hands. Eventually, we would want to tackle much rougher and dirtier pairs of shoes. Here, our subject, not able to touch the shoes, simply hovers her hand over the top of the shoe while thinking about touching the top. She might hover ever more closely until she feels the discomfort drop, in which case she may be ready simply to touch the top of the shoe. As simple as this looks, this may be very challenging for some individuals with contamination fear from dirt or germs. She may be thinking, where has this shoe been? Did somebody step on the top of this shoe? Maybe I walked in somebody's steps who had just walked through a yard with dog feces. Rubbing the whole hand on the top of the shoe may be more difficult. She is getting more involved and putting herself more into the exposure exercise. Much more difficult is touching the bottom of the shoe. She has used public bathroom facilities. Who knows what might have been on the floor? Here is an escalation beyond simple touching. She is rubbing her hand on the bottom of the shoe. This is a more advanced step. She has taken her contaminated hand from the bottom of her shoe and has wiped it on the other hand and forearm. More difficult steps include rubbing the hands together and wiping them on the hair, face, shoulders, down the body, over the torso, right back to the shoes. Now we have contaminated the whole body. At this point, she will need to just sit with that exposure for a time and wait for the discomfort to drop. We like to use 90-minute exposure or longer sessions and repeat them daily until the person habituates or gets used to the exposure. That would be a sub-level of about a 2. The duration of each session can vary depending on how quickly the person is able to habituate. Many people dislike using public restrooms. We often carry distorted beliefs about what might be transmitted to us by touching a handle or doorknob, let alone a toilet seat. What about the herpes virus, HIV, or other sexually transmitted diseases? These organisms don't survive for long outside the human body, especially not on a cold, hard toilet seat. And to infect you, they need to enter either through an open cut or sore, or by way of a mucous membrane, your mouth or rectum, for example, which wouldn't normally come into contact with the seat. All this makes the odds of infection from just sitting down minuscule. It turns out your skin is a very effective protective barrier just like you learned in health class in the fourth grade. So here we go into a clean public restroom with simple door handle touching. Notice she is not using a handkerchief, an elbow, or a tissue to open the door, and she has no long sleeve to pull down over her hand to turn the knob. Imagination creates fear. We spend much more time avoiding and fearing situations than we actually spend confronting them. 
Here our subject simply is thinking about touching a toilet handle. This may take a while, but her therapist will be calm and patient and stay with her until her anxiety drops and she is ready for the next step. She has progressed to touching a handle and flushes the toilet. She is one step closer to using a public facility. She may stop avoiding shopping trips or going to the movie for fear of needing to use the bathroom. This is a major step. You see her simply touching a toilet seat. Here our subject is putting both hands on the seat and thoroughly wiping the seat with both hands. She may have had many repetitions of other exposure activities than you've seen in this presentation example in order to develop the capability to do this. She also knows that the probability of contracting any disease or STD is minuscule. As you probably know, STD germs don't last long on these surfaces. For other germs to be a problem, one would need a cut on the skin for the germ to have a chance of survival. Of course, people with OCD would probably fear they have a cut or a break in their skin and they just can't see it. If they checked for a cut and didn't see one, they may have to check again because they would be concerned that they missed seeing a cut that might be there. Eventually, they might find this procedure impossible and simply continue to avoid public restrooms. It doesn't matter that millions of people use public facilities daily and they do not contract illnesses. They believe that they may be the exception. Next, in a more advanced step, and following our protocol, she rubs both hands together. Now she rubs both contaminated hands on her arms. It takes a lot of courage to push oneself to do these exercises and avoid the compulsion of washing or taking a shower. Next you see her wiping her face. She will follow the protocol and rub her hands on her hair, torso, and all the way down to her ankles and feet. She has confronted more than she will ever actually face using a public restroom. People usually wash their hands and dry with a paper towel. She knows that won't really be necessary. Her skin is a great barrier for any germ. Nothing will go through her clothes. She could go for 72 hours without washing, and the worst case scenario is that she will have simply left washing her hands out of her routine, much to the chagrin of people who sell hand sanitizers. Imagine people with OCD and with anxiety disorders reducing their discomfort so that they are free to be themselves. When you come into our reception area, you will see a quote from the famous Austrian psychiatrist who survived the Holocaust and wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning. It reads, Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. This quote summarizes what we do with our clients and patients. We can find freedom by choosing what to do with that space between stimulus and response. If you are somebody you love, suffers from obsessive compulsive disorder, feel free to call Behavioral Sciences of Alabama at 256-883-3231 for help with OCD and anxiety disorders.